Hi everyone. Uh, today we are moving on into the ninth part of physics, which is going to be rotational dynamics. Now, rotational dynamics is a particularly interesting uh, corner of physics because it kind of represents a crossing into another sort of level of sophistication. And the reason is that rotations are really important because everything that a real physical object can do, like an extended object like you or a car or anything really can be decomposed into two types of motion. Uh, the first is everything that we've been studying up to this point in the class. It is the motion of the center of mass as it acts under uh, Newton's laws. This is the case where you're really looking at F equals MA, uh, parabolic motion. And this is why we draw all our free body diagrams as points, because that's supposed to represent the center of mass of the object. Now we're moving into part two, which is the rotational motion around that center of mass. And we're going to uh, start by having to develop a new vocabulary uh, through kinematics and then talk about the equivalence of dynamics. So now onward to part two. We first have to talk about how things move. Much like we did at the beginning, we discussed the kinematics of how things moved uh, by talking about acceleration and velocities and displacement. Uh, and these are what we will often call the linear quantities uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, but we are going to instead talk about their rotational equivalence, and we're going to rely a lot on parallels uh, with their linear uh, quantities. So let's start out by thinking about a spinning disk. This is a top-down view of a spinning disk, and it's going around in circles uh, here in this direction. And we want to describe the motion of point P, which is sitting somewhere on this disk, and it will move around. Now, we're going to set down a polar coordinate system, and we're going to set up some line here that is an arbitrary zero point for the motion of the line. So this is going to correspond to an angle, and we'll usually use theta is equal to zero. And then as that object moves <laughs> around, there is an angle from that line as it moves upward that represents that angle theta. And if that point is a distance r from the center of the motion, then the point is going to move along a path here that has an arc length that we're going to define as s. And in that case, the angle is just going to be the arc length divided by the radius or multiplying the radius up, the arc length of the arc is the radius times the angle. Now, this equation only works for theta into radians. And so up to this point in the course, we've been fine with just leaving the calculator stuck in the degree mode, but now we actually have to care. So pay attention to what your calculator is doing if we're considering things in radians and you get angles in radians. Usually the hint is there's a bunch of pi running around. Uh, okay, so let's move on. We generally are going to refer to the angle in terms of uh, a standard direction where we're going to call positive angle to be the counterclockwise direction following the conventions of math. So start at the x equals zero or the x-axis, the y equals zero line, and move around in the positive direction. That's counterclockwise. And going clockwise when uh, viewed from above, we're going to call that the negative direction. And so an angle less than zero is going to refer to moving in the clockwise direction from our arbitrary line. Now, we also use negative signs for the uh, um, angular uh, equivalence of velocity and acceleration, so they will often also be called negative. And uh, in that case, we uh, can sort of set up our mechanics in terms of uh, equivalence to the kinematic quantities. So the 
Angular displacement is the difference in angle from one angle uh, relative to the initial, and that's equivalent to the uh, displacement in linear quantities, which is one coordinate, uh, the distance from the coordinate origin, or the vector from the coordinate origin where it ends, relative to where it began, and you just use a minus sign. Here we take angle at the end, minus angle at the beginning, and that's my angular displacement. My speed is going to be given in a uh, angular uh, in angular equivalent, which is the displacement divided by a time interval. And then, of course, since we're in calculus, as we consider the limit as delta t goes to zero, that's going to be of delta theta over delta t. That's going to be d delta theta over delta t, or d by dt, and that we're going to give the variable of omega. It's going to look like a curly omega, or a curly w, uh, but it is the lowercase Greek letter omega. And so when you see this, and it looks like, you know, a little uh, curly w, that is uh, the actual, that's a Greek letter uh, which is the lowercase omega. Uh, and just by analogy, the average is the displacement over time. So you see we're building an analogy here. There's linear uh, velocities and then there's angular velocities. Now, I'll note that uh, we'll often engage in uniform rotation, and in that case, the angular speed uh, can be related to the period, which is how long it takes to go around. And so that is uh, just two pi radians divided by the time it takes to execute one complete revolution. And so that's a quick way to interpret what the angular speed or angular velocity of the system is. Now, since we're in calculus-based physics, we should understand that there's actually vector-based conventions for these. So these are equivalent to just the simple plus or minus that I've heard described, but the second we start having objects rotating with different rotational axes, we need to develop an idea of a vector angle. And you can't really define an angle, but you can describe an angular displacement. And so we'll often write that def, uh, angular displacement in terms of a vector. And that vector is defined by the right-hand rule. And so the uh, so just because angles don't have directions, but the differences between them do, because I care whether I am rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. And we think about this in terms of a circle and we apply our right hand rule. So you take your right hand and you curl it in the direction of motion and then your thumb is going to indicate the direction of the angular displacement vector. So you just sort of curl around. You don't have to do one vector into the other right away, but you just sort of curl your fingers in the direction that they need to go, and then your thumb is going to indicate the angular velocity. If you curl the other way, uh, you'll notice that the angular displacement's pointed down that way. So in general, uh, if we have rotation in the xy plane and it's going counterclockwise, then the plus z axis is the positive angular displacement. Okay, um, so to fill this out a little bit more, we uh, can think about our uh, time derivative of the angular displacement uh, here, and that's the omega, and then the rotational speed uh, is whatever direction it is uh, sort of rotating using the right-hand rule. And then we establish this uh, omega vector that points out along the rotational axis uh, of this. Uh, if it's going counterclockwise when viewed from the top, so in this direction, right-hand rule would indicate that the vector is pointing upward along the axis. Uh, it points along the rotation axis, a longer vector just means that the object is spinning faster. Uh, the angular velocity is measured in radians per second, and then we use our right-hand rule. Uh, we can also have it rotating in counter, uh, sorry, clockwise when viewed from top. So that's like this when viewed from the top. Uh, and in that case, uh, the vector is pointed down, which is set by the right-hand rule. Okay. Um, 
The reason this becomes important is that we can actually turn everything into vectors if we define our angular uh, velocity vector in uh, this fashion. So uh, if we have a angular velocity omega that's pointed up along the rotation axis and we have a displacement from the rotation axis to some point here, using the right-hand rule, omega cross r, using that right-hand rule cross product, points in the direction that the object is moving as a velocity vector. So this is going to become important later, especially when we start dealing with torques and we have to know what the torque vector is doing to the angular uh, velocity vector. But we'll get there. Um, but for now, I just want to point and note that the velocity is omega cross with the distance from the axis drawn as a vector. So uh, this is just a relationship we can use and one of the reasons why we define the angular velocity in this way. Note it is not v as a vector does not equal r cross omega because anti-commutative. The cross product does not go backwards. So it would be pointed in the wrong direction. Don't do that. So it's always omega cross r uh, for this. OK, uh, we can then define the angular acceleration as uh, d, uh, d omega dt. So just like dv by dt is the linear acceleration, the angular alpha, uh, this is a Greek letter alpha, um, is going to be the angular or acceleration and it's also going to come with a vector and then we can use alpha cross with the radius vector like so uh, to figure out what the tangential component of the acceleration is. There'll be a normal acceleration in circular motion that's uh, the centripetal acceleration but just the tangential is just going to be alpha crossed with r. Okay, so if we think about how these vectors uh, relate uh, to each other, if we have a rotating disk, its angular velocity is going to be pointed up along the x-axis or the z-axis by the right-hand rule. Uh, so it's pointed up in this direction. And if this it's rotating faster, so it's speeding up, the angular acceleration vector is also pointed upward. And so what that means is that a little while later, the omega is going to get an alpha t vector component added to it, and then it's going to correspond to a longer vector, and that means that the object is going to be rotating faster. So that gives us this vector getting progressively longer uh, as the alpha vector adds to omega, and that just corresponds to it spinning faster and faster. Similarly, if we have the object rotating at the same speed, but the angular acceleration vector is downward, that's going to make the omega vector shorter, and so that's going to correspond to the object rotating more slowly, and so it's going to be spinning down uh, as it goes down. So it's going to rotate progressively more and more uh, slowly, it'll come to a halt, and then it would change direction and go the other way. Uh, similarly, if the alpha vector is pointed down and the omega vector is also pointing down, corresponding to clockwise rotation, in that case, then it would be it would speed up, but going in the clockwise direction. Okay. Now, just like for linear kinematics, we can also use calculus to relate our angular kinematic quantities. So this means that we alpha is d omega by dt, so we can integrate uh, from some initial angular speed to whatever the angular speed currently is. And that gives me the integral from zero to t of alpha, d, alpha dt. And so then if this is constant right here, let me uh, highlight that for constant angular acceleration, we pull the alpha part out of the integral and out pops omega naught plus alpha t just like we would normally get in a um, uh, linear kinematics problem, except instead of v's, we have omegas. Similarly, omega is d theta by dt, and if we integrate from uh, to some theta zero up to theta, 
uh, of the angular velocity uh, component. So that's here. Uh, then we get uh, it, both of these being constant, we get back to a very familiar looking equation, except it's in Greek, uh, which is uh, perfectly fine. And then we can take these two equations, just like we did previously, and substitute in and come up with yet another kinematic equation. So you, you've seen this before, you, because you have all the stuff that you know, been doing since way back in the day in physics, and then we just do it all again in Greek letters. All we do is replace our A's with our alphas, our omegas become V's, and our thetas become X's. And the two are equivalent, so it's just the exact same equations for a constant angular acceleration. And all of our pieces kind of click into place here. So let's get uh, practical with this approach. Let's consider top-down view of two ninja on a spinning platform. It's part of ninja training, uh, as I'm sure you know. Uh, if the platform is slowly accelerating from rest at a rate of alpha equals 0 0.01 rad per second squared, I want to know how far ninja B has traveled in linear distance after 10 seconds. Well, this is a constant angular acceleration problem. And so what I'll do is I'll figure out what my theta final is, given my theta initial. And I know that the, oops, sorry, let me uh, write it just like the equation, is theta initial plus omega naught times t plus one half alpha t squared from the uh, given problem, we are starting from rest, and so the omega naught term is going to go to zero. And then I need to figure out the total distance traveled, so that's theta f minus theta i is the angle that I want, so just basically the angular displacement is one half alpha t squared, and then I plug this all in. One half alpha is given in the problem as 0 0.01 rad per second squared, and I multiply by the time, which is 10 seconds squared. And so then this answer is 0.01 times 100, uh, and I get one half of a radian. And that's the angle that's traveled. And then I will use my relationship that the path that is actually travels, S is equal to R theta, and I've given that R is 20 meters up here in the problem. So then I just do 20 meters times half a radian, is equal to 10 meters. And that's how far it's traveled. Done. Uh, moving right along, let's bring in some calculus because, I mean, who, who could resist? Uh, the question here is the angle through which a bicycle wheel turns is given by theta of t is equal to a plus bt squared minus ct cubed, where a, b, and c are positive constants, and t is in seconds, and then theta is in radians. So they're just some constants. Calculate the angular acceleration of the wheel as a function of time. Hmm. Okay. And then at what time is the angular velocity of the wheel instantaneously not changing? I'm going to go ahead and answer the second part first. That just means if the velocity is not changing, then we must be at some point where alpha of t is equal to zero. Now we just got to figure out part A. So let's do that. Uh, if we hop in, let's thicken things up a little bit here. Uh, to figure out omega, why that is d theta by dt, and I have an expression for theta, so this is d by dt of the a plus bt squared minus ct cubed. And so then the a, uh, when you take the derivative, goes away. So we are left with 2bt minus 3ct squared, and then I consider alpha is d omega by dt, and when I take the time derivative of this expression, I get that that's 2b minus 3, uh, oops, let's uh, bring down the 2, that's 6ct. And then to do part b, I want to figure out where that's 0. So for part b, I just set 2b minus 6ct equal to 0, and then from there I get that uh, 6ct is equal to 2b, and then t is equal to 
B over 3C, canceling the twos as it comes across. Next, uh, I have a question of what happens if a bar on a hinge starts from rest and rotates with an angular acceleration uh, given by alpha t is 10 plus 6t rad per second squared, where t is in seconds. Determine the angle and radians through which the bar turns in the first four seconds. This is not a constant acceleration problem. And so that means we have to fall back to calculus. So first, I want to figure out what omega of t is. Why, that is omega, whatever it starts at, plus the integral of, uh, from 0 to t of 10 plus 6t dt. And so then that's just going to be 10t plus 6t squared over 2 all evaluated from 0 to t, and so that's just 10t plus 3t squared. And that's my omega. Uh, I've dropped an omega naught because it starts from rest. So let me expressly cancel that out right now. So it starts out from rest, and then we get that expression. Then what we want to do is figure out what theta of t is. Why, that's uh, wherever it starts from plus the integral from 0 to t of uh, my expression for omega, which is 10t plus 3t squared all times dt. And so then that's equal to wherever it starts from plus uh, 10t squared over 2 plus uh, 3t squared over 3 evaluated from 0 to t. And so this is equal to theta naught uh, plus 5t squared uh, plus t cubed. And then we want the angle and radians through which the bar turns in the first uh, four seconds. So we want theta minus theta naught is the answer. That's how far it has moved from that initial uh, position. That's the displacement. And then we just plug in our number. So this is 5 times t squared which is 4.0 seconds squared, plus t cubed, uh, which is uh, 4 seconds cubed. And this is equal to 144 radians. Uh, so you remember that we have all of these numbers are set up to give us answers in radians. So t is in seconds. Uh, so that's why the units are weird. Uh, we're just sloppy with our initial equation. The next thing we want to look into is the rotation of rigid bodies. So these are fixed uh, sort of solid bodies that don't kind of distort around with respect to each other. And we're going to use our relations here that we can relate tangential and angular kinematic quantities. So V and A are just omega cross R and alpha cross R respectively. And then we also have the relationship that since s is equal to r times theta, and we take the time derivatives for an object where the radius distance isn't changing and it's moving around on a circular motion, then uh, we can figure out uh, by taking d omega by dt, uh, or d theta by dt, that gets us omega, and omega times r is the tangential velocity, and then alpha times r is the uh, tangential acceleration. Now, we have, in general, an expression for our acceleration, which is that in terms of normal nt coordinates, like we did way back when, uh, we have a, a normal component and a tangential component. And if we were restricting to the case of a rigid body where a particle is moving around the axis in a circular motion, not like an ellipse or something weird, then we know that the normal component of the acceleration is equal to v squared over r. And if I then take v as omega, v is equal to omega r, I plug that in and I get that uh, v squared is omega squared r squared divided by r. The normal component to the acceleration can also just be expressed as omega squared r. 
And the total acceleration's magnitude is just the square root of a sub n squared plus a sub t squared, and we have an expression for both of those. And we get that it's r times omega to the fourth plus alpha squared once we factor out r radial distance squared, just the magnitude of the distance from the axis. So let's uh, consider our ninja on a rotating platform once again. And we're going to consider the case where uh, the they're rotating around. We want to find out ninja B's uh, acceleration total after 15 seconds. And at that point, given our acceleration profile, omega is uh, 0.15 radians per second at 15 seconds, and alpha is equal to 0.01 rad per second squared. And we are dealing with the uh, 20 meters is the distance from the axis to the ninja there. Well, uh, that's just applying this equation. The total acceleration A is R times the square root of omega to the fourth plus alpha squared. And we just stick in our equation. This is 20 meters times the square root of omega to the fourth, which is 0 0.15 rad per second to the fourth power plus alpha, which is equal to uh, 0 0.01 rad per second squared to the uh, second power. And if we plug all of that in, we get an answer of 0 0.49 meters per second squared. So we can figure out uh, the acceleration of the ninja at a given point, just remembering that there's both a normal and a tangential component to the acceleration. Okay, so moving on, we can also develop the ideas of uh, kinetic energy for objects that are spinning. And in this case, we have a uh, particle moving on a circular path. And we want to figure out its kinetic energy. If it's a circle, you know it's just moving around here on this circular trajectory like that. It has a tangential speed, v sub t. And so 1 half mv squared in this case is just 1 half mvt squared. And then I can replace that vt with my r omega. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of move the uh, variables around and I'm going to identify this term right here, m r squared. And I'm going to call that i, which is the moment of inertia. It's defined for a single point particle. So as this thing is rotating around on a circle uh, with radius r, its moment of inertia is m r squared. So that's how we uh, get this all figured out. Um, so this is uh, great, not obvious what the utility of this is. We could just also just write down one half mv squared. Uh, but that becomes more important when we have extended objects like this strawberry here. And if we think about what's happening if a par uh, strawberry is made up of lots of little particles, and I've represented a couple little particles here with the black dots, and I want to know what happens to the uh, energy of the system for a bunch of particles all with the same omega. And you can think about what happens here uh, in the case where this strawberry is rotating, and then each individual particle is going to have a circular path that it traces out. It just moves around in a circle here uh, and uh, at a constant distance from the axis. So we can consider this strawberry as a sum of a bunch of point particles. And if we do that and we sort of add up every strawberry, we sort of figure out that every, uh, every particle in the strawberry has a kinetic energy of 1 half mv squared, where we're summing over the i indexed particles in the strawberry. Uh, what we're going to do is we will write down each of those as omega r i squared. Important point, this omega is the same for every particle. Same, because that's how long it takes to go around. 2 pi over t, where t is the period, that gives me my, my omega. But for the different particles, ri is different. So 
That means that we can pull this omega term out of my summation. And so what I'll do is I'll just pop it out in front or in back, uh, squaring both things, and I get a sum of mi ri squared. And this is the moment of inertia of an extended object. So it's still one half i omega squared is the kinetic energy, but i is this sum of all the point particles in the system. Now, for continuous objects, that sum is a bunch a sum of a bunch of little things. And so we actually use an integral definition where we say that the uh, i is the integral of r squared times a little bit of mass in the system. And that's how we calculate a lot of the classic formulas that we use in this chapter here. You've probably seen some of them before. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But this means that moments of inertia, one, can sort of be pre-calculated for an object. It's just kind of an intrinsic property of a distribution of mass and a rotation axis. And so we can figure it out where the uh, mass of the object that's spinning and how far those objects are from the rotation axis, that's basically this or the mr squared term in the previous sum, uh, that sets the moment of inertia for a system. But it depends on the choice of axis. So choice of axis in the system actually matters. So that's important. Uh, and so we'll have to deal with the fact that occasionally it's not rotating around what you might expect. So let's actually calculate a moment of inertia for a continuous object here. Uh, we'll start out with a thin uniform rod of length L that's spun around its end. We want to figure out a moment of inertia. I'm going to assume that this rod has a total mass M, so that's the mass of a rod. And then a tiny little bit of uh, mass, uh, length of the rod is going to have a mass that's sort of proportional to the density. It's a uniform, so it changes all the way through. And so I'm going to define lambda as a linear mass density. That's going to be m over l. And this is a linear mass density. And then a tiny little bit of mass, a dm here, is going to be equal to lambda times a little bit of the length. And I'll call that r. So we'll measure r from over here out to some point in the middle of the rod. And that's going to be my radius vector r. So that's how far it is from the rotation axis. So let's calculate this for the end. We just write down that integral where i is equal to the integral of from 0 to l of r squared dm, and that's equal to integral 0 to l of r squared times lambda times dr. There's a lambda integral 0 to l of r squared dr, which is going to be l cubed over 3 times lambda. But doesn't look like a great expression for a moment of inertia. I can recognize that lambda times L is equal to the mass of the rod. That gets rid of that linear mass density. And then my moment of inertia is equal to M L squared over three. Okay, so done. Now let's spin it around the middle. I'm going to say that the all of the math holds up to uh, this expression that i is going to be equal to the integral uh, of how far the uh, radius is from the axis. And if I'm measuring now from this point, oops, the wrong tool, uh, this point, then my radius vector only goes out a distance l over 2. And so therefore, my integral is going to go from minus L over 2 to L over up to L over 2 R squared dm and that's all that changes is the bounds of the integration and so we can just write this as lambda times R squared dr from minus L over 2 to L over 2 
it's the same integral, lambda times, and then we're going to get L cubed over three, or sorry, R cubed over three, R cubed over three evaluated from minus L over two to L over two. And so then that is going to be a lambda times L cubed over uh, 24, which is three times, uh, sorry, uh, do, 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 three times eight, because a half cubed is an eighth, uh, minus uh, a negative L cubed over, it's going to be 24 again. And so if I do that, I get this is lambda times L cubed over 12, which is a 24th plus a 24th is a 12th, or M L squared over 12. So then we see that the moments of inertia depend on where they are spun. And the general sense of it is, if there's more mass located farther away from the moment of inertia, like when we spun from the end, and we are all this mass over here, that matters quadratically. So it depends on the distance squared from the axis. So it really does depend. And so the moments of inertia for things spun around their end are going to be longer than for things that are spun around their middle here. Well, compound objects, which you take one object and another object, uh, are uh, going to just be the sums of the moments of inertia. So in this case, uh, the um, object here is uh, some masses, at big M, uh, and some masses, little m. And we're going to call these rods, these are be called light rods. And that just means that they're not heavy, and therefore they don't contribute to the moment of inertia. And if we spin it around this object here, we can figure out the moment of inertia as i is just the sum of m i r i squared. Now, what is important is that I measure it from the moment of inertia. So let's start considering our objects. We'll move from left to right. So i is equal to, here's my first object over here. It is a distance of a plus a or 2a away from the uh, rotation axis. Therefore, its moment of inertia contribution is m, little m, times 2a quantity squared. Then for my next object, it is a distance of a from the rotation axis. This distance b doesn't matter. It's only measured straight over to the rotation axis. So it has a moment of inertia contribution of m times a squared. A similar thing goes for down here. So that's another plus m a squared. And then this object here is on the rotation axis. So we're considering them to be small. So it just has a moment of inertia contribution of zero. So the total moment of inertia for this entire system is for little m a squared plus two big M a squared. And we're done. Add moments of inertia. Now you'll notice that uh, the moment of inertia kind of seems to appear in kinetic energy formulas with one half i omega squared. So it's a half something times a speed squared. And the moment of inertia is essentially the equivalent of the mass in the kinetic uh, energy system, uh, or the in the kinetic energy, and indeed in rotation and dynamics or whatever. So I you should think of as equivalent to mass. All right. So this is just a sampling of moments of inertia uh, for different systems. So if we consider both a thin disk or a solid cylinder here, uh, that are rotated around this z-axis as drawn, they have a moment of inertia of a half mr squared. A rectangular sheet of length uh, or height and width, h and w, is 1 12th times the mass of the sheet times h squared plus w squared. So it gives you a sense of that. Um, so it's kind of like a thin rod for reasons that fall out of calculus. Uh, this was the... Uh, spinning a rod around its middle gave 112 
ML squared, so that was also there. A solid sphere, uh, always a fan of this one. Uh, this is, ooh, this is not right. Um, uh, it is two fifths MR squared. There's a property of a solid sphere that's three fifths uh, M over R, or M squared over R. That's the gravitational binding energy. I use it all the time in my work, uh, but uh, this should be two fifths M R squared, not three fifths. A hollow shell has a moment of inertia. So there's no mass inside. It's all kind of on the edge here. That's two thirds M R squared. And then a ring of mass just has uh, mass times R squared, which is kind of what you would expect for a single particle. So solid sphere, two fifths M R squared. Now, as we saw, sometimes you spin an object that's around an axis, not going through its center of mass. Everything on this sheet here is going through the center of mass of the um, objects here. So these are going through and passing through these points here, which are the center of mass of the system. And that's what their, our pre-calculated values are from. Now, if we look at uh, an axis that's not going through the center of mass, we need to apply uh, a shift or an increase to the moment of inertia, and we use something called the parallel axis theorem. And we take all these tabulated moments of inertia through the center of mass, and then we add an offset to them that kind of considers the object uh, center of masses rotation around the new axis. So if I have my nice little cylinder here and I have a rotation uh, axis that goes through the center of the center of mass, which is uh, right here. It's at, uh, the center of mass moment of inertia is one half MR squared. Yeah, right, right here, that one. And then if I go ahead and shift to a different rotation axis, all I do to figure out the moment of inertia is I add the mass of the object plus d squared, which is how far I am shifting my rotation axis uh, over. So that's your uh, sort of rule of thumb to figure out where the uh, new moment of inertia is. Take the tabulated one at m plus d squared. A little more on that uh, later in an example. So now we can think about energies in systems that consider two parts. First is the kinetic energy of a system, which is the sum of the translational motion and then the rotational motion of the object. And so if the object is moving uh, its center of mass, not just rotating it, then we uh, get uh, these two parts. The kinetic energy is one half mv squared of the center of mass plus one half i omega squared for the uh, kinetic and rotational kinetic energy. An important rule is that the gravitational energy is the mass times g times the height of the center of mass. And so all these other parts that are moving around, they kind of balance out. Some parts of the object are higher, some parts of the object are lower, but since it's the center of mass, that's what matters for the gravitational potential. And if we work with these basics, then we can just keep doing conservation of energy problems, including this rotational kinetic energy term. This gives us a good sense of how to fit together all of our pieces of angular kinematics and also introduces the idea of moment of inertia, which kind of takes the place of mass in the system and just show that we can engage with some energy uh, problems using just these tools. Uh, so next time we'll talk about the equivalence of forces which we call torques in this situation. And we'll talk about the equivalent of momentum, which is angular momentum. And then we get this all put together and we can describe literally everything big. So uh, until next time, uh, hope you enjoy uh, spinning right round.